and welcome to another episode of History Now. We're in, you know, unfamiliar surroundings. Uh, first time back in the studio in over a year. Uh, joining me today to talk about his latest book, A Difficult Birth, The Early Years of Northern Ireland, is historian Dr. Alan Parkinson. Alan, thanks for joining me today. Uh, you've, you're over here for a couple of the Northern Ireland centenary events. What's it feel like to be doing these things in person now? Well, it's, um, I wasn't sure for a while if I would be able to get back, uh, come back over here for it. But, uh, and of course, it's not quite the same. I, I had expected to be talking to people face to face, but I've been doing a few media things and, and uh, Zoom events uh, to various local councils across the north. Uh, so it hasn't been quite the same, but at least um, I've managed to come over. Yeah. yeah. So Alan, your new book, um, A Difficult Birth, The Early Years of Northern Ireland, 1920 to 25, it deals a lot with the, as it says, the difficult birth of, of the state. You focus a lot in the early passages on the violence, uh, and, but you do contrast it with later periods of violence. Could we talk about, because I mentioned in a previous show with Marie Coleman about the violence around, you know, 100 years ago, but you go into it in a lot of detail and you emphasize the sort of tit for tat nature. I think that today we're not really fully aware of how intense this violent period was. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about it? It was uh, certainly, Barry, a very intensive uh, period of violence. It went on, um, started basically in, in Derry City in the spring, early summer of 1920 and fizzled out in 1922 in Belfast. Uh, so it was a relatively short period, two and a half years, but the violence was extremely intense. There were over 500 fatalities and several thousand people injured in Belfast. And there were over 100 uh, uh, people killed and hundreds injured in uh, other parts of the province of Ulster in, in that period. So the violence was, was quite intense. If you compare that to, for example, the modern troubles, uh, it's only one year would compete with that, and that was 1972. Belfast is a different city in many ways than what it was then. Much more tightly packed and, you know, less sort of demarcations of, you know, nationalist and loyalist territory. Yeah. How did that factor into the intensive nature well, yeah, of it? Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, the demography of Belfast was very different. A uh, hundred years ago, you had, uh, it was mainly a, a, what you might call a, a, a Protestant city. Uh, a, a, up to 70% of the population, two thirds at least of the population was Protestant. There were a handful of largely Catholic areas, uh, but there were, as you suggested or hinted at, quite a few mixed areas. And that's, of course, they were the areas where violence was most likely to, to break out in. I suppose the, uh, the violence was, uh, a lot of it, not all of it by any means, but a lot of it was, as you say, tit for tat killings. Uh, I suppose the typical pattern would have been uh, that a couple of police officers, RIC, or later on uh, special constables, uh, were shot, targeted by the third, particularly the third Northern Division of the IRA uh, in, in, in Belfast. And later uh, there would be reprisal attacks, and we may well come back to this, by uh, what I call in my books the um, uh, rogue cops, policemen, uh, deviant police officers or more often uh, by members of the Loyalist paramilitary force at the time, uh, the Ulster Protestant Association, the UPA. So you, you've mentioned there in Derry, I think that's around you know, the, the local government elections of 1920, that period onwards. By the end of that year, you're getting the Government of Ireland Act. So yeah. you're an immense constitutional change here. How did that sort of filter into the violence well, on the I ground? Suppose Barry, probably the main theme of the book, uh, what I consider to be the main theme anyway, is uh, the vital uh, interrelationship uh, between uh, imminent political and constitutional change uh, and communal instability. And that, of course, has been a constant factor in our history, going back to the mid 19th century. And uh, I suppose uh, O'Connell's push towards the repeal of the Act of Union in the 1840s when there were riots in the city, particularly in 1886 when Gladstone, I refer to this in the book, there were sectarian riots in Belfast, well over 50 people killed. Uh, and of course, in the modern troubles, uh, particularly violent years were 1972, which I alluded to earlier, 
uh, when direct rule was impending, and also 1985-87 uh, period, over the time period of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, when loyalist violence was 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 pretty strong. So so and you and you also mentioned the the um, uh, changes in Derry, where a nationalist corporation was elected for the first time. The Government of Ireland Act was. Uh, introduced in the Parliament in the, uh, I think it was February 1920, and it became law just before Christmas of that year, which set up, of course, the Parliament, a new Parliament, the elections and the new Parliament. You've looked at some, you know, what are notorious incidents of, of violence, yeah, the McMahon family and, and yeah. others. Can you give us a sense of maybe a couple of those and how, you know, they're Yeah, you know, I mean, some of the acts of violence on both sides, uh, I, I tend to refer to it as a sectarian war uh, uh, rather than a pogrom because I, I think it was multi... A pogrom is, explanation is too simplistic, I think. Uh, uh, both sides were involved in it and every nobody's uh, guiltless. Some of the most horrendous incidents were when four Protestants were targeted in a cooperage uh, where they were making barrels in, I think it was Little Patrick Street, uh, by the IRA. A 10-strong squad of the IRA went in uh, and asked the uh, workers to identify them, their religions. And the Protestant, the small group of Protestants were shot, uh, uh, four or five of them, three of them fatally. You also had uh, the horrendous attacks on Catholics. Uh, one Catholic barman who was making his way back from his work in the city centre uh, got off the bus near the Short Strand uh, and he was attacked by a group of loyalists who threw him into the river or threw him off the bridge in, into the river. Despite his protestations that he, he couldn't swim uh, and he, he drowned. Uh, and also there was a, a, a Catholic housekeeper um, uh, for a Protestant doctor in Donegal Pass area to the south of the, of the city centre, who was actually torched, set on fire um, uh, when she opened the door to the surgery. Uh, she did survive, but she was seriously injured. And then, of course, there were the, uh, the dreadful attacks on tram cars, um, uh, with uh, two Catholics being shot dead for crossing themselves as they passed the Catholic church. Uh, uh, you, you had the IRA petrol bombing, uh, uh, bo uh, setting fire, millet bombs into uh, tram cars, uh, carrying Protestant workers back to North and West Belfast. Uh, and perhaps the two most, well, two of the most horrendous acts of the lot were the murder of the McMahon families and the murder of Protestants in Alton of Aid. In fact, when I, my, my book came out, the first book on Holy War book came out in 2004, and I was researching that a few years, obviously, before that. Uh, and there hadn't really been anything very much um, uh, published directly on the, particularly a, a kind of a, a non-partisan account of, of the violence. There hadn't been anything really. Uh, so, uh, and I did call it, it in the press publicity at the time, the unknown conflict. So during this period of intense conflict, what is the situation with the London and Dub Dublin governments? Well, first of all, the London administration. Um, after the Great War, uh, Lloyd George, uh, who was the British Prime Minister at the time, Liberal Prime Minister, uh, was anxious, a bit like I suppose you could make a comparison with Tony Blair in the 1990s, to, um, in a sense, I may be being cynical here, but cement his own personal political legacy. Uh, and try to solve the Irish crisis. There were practical uh, issues also, Barry, because he was concerned about the economic costs of having a war in the north of Ireland, as well as having disturbances uh, in the rest of Ireland, because, of course, the Anglo-Irish War was, uh, had started some time before. Um, so uh, London had a, a role in this. They, they, uh, as I said earlier, they, um, Lloyd George put forward his Better Government of Ireland Act in February uh, 1920. Uh, he had a job, in a sense, persuading uh, both sections of the community, because to unionists, uh, the uh, Better Government of Ireland bill that was going through in the initial stages did concern them deeply, because they thought that uh, this was another form of home rule, which, of course, they had opposed for decades. And it was only, in fact, it was perhaps James Crit, one of his greatest achievements. We know some of his own goals, but one of his better, one of his best achievements, I think, was 
uh, to persuade the Protestant population uh, that um, uh, it was, uh, this was not something to be scared of. They had their own destiny in their own hands. The nationalists, on the other hand, were completely um, opposed to partition, and we may well come back to that in a second. The Dublin administration, uh, the Flexion administration in, in Dublin, uh, they didn't want any part of partition, of course, and they went their own way eventually. Uh, but they were um, um, opposed very much uh, to what was happening. Uh, and the uh, early administration to carry on an economic boycott of Belfast, uh, where you had um, uh, northern goods were intercepted around the border areas. Uh, the goods uh, were destroyed. In some cases, they were sent back. Uh, northern currency was uh, shunned. Uh, the banks were forced to close. It didn't have the uh, enormous fiscal ramifications that they were, Dublin, had been expecting, but it did do some damage. So, Alan, could we talk about the first election for the, for the Northern Parliament? Because, you know, it's, it's monumental, but there's interesting things in the book. Would you mention how it was embraced by working class loyalists? And there seems to be some class issues where other sort of middle class probably weren't quite as invested in it. Would that be a fair comment? Well, Craig's great achievement, as I hinted at earlier, was to unify the loyalist, the Protestant section of the community. So, uh, in other words, he managed to dissuade uh, Labour activists uh, who, uh, who had been in the uh, Ulster Unionist Labour Association group uh, uh, advocated by Carson and himself uh, to uh, abstain from actually standing. It was official Unionist Party candidates only. Uh, and that was his great achievement. But you're right. I mean, the most uh, kind of um, obvious uh, enthusiasm for the election did come in the mainly loyalist heartlands of the Shankill Road and East Belfast and parts of North Belfast as well. But that's not to say that the middle classes did not turn out on election day because the election turnout uh, across the boards, in fact, was very high in some constituencies. It was 90 90 percent. Contrast that with the nationalist side. Um, you're looking at people who were the likes of Joe Devlin, you know, constitutional nationalists and, and Sinn Féin almost, you know, coming together, whereas the 1918 election a couple of years earlier, there were bitter rivals. So can we talk about that and perhaps some of the people we term uh, historical heavyweights come yeah, in to yeah, contest yeah, the elections? Certainly with some of those. Yeah, the um, UIL, the United Irish League, uh, the Devlin's group and uh, Sinn Féin uh, were, of course, opposed uh, to the legislation. They were opposed to partition. Uh, and on that basis, and Devlin uh, did meet with De Valera uh, a while before the election, I think it was in St. Patrick's Day, a few, uh, uh, several weeks before, and they came up with some kind of agreement, uh, which meant basically that they would express their opposition to what was going on, they would abstain from the, uh, the, the, the parliamentary body, uh, and uh, they would uh, encourage their supporters to cast their second votes because it was the first uh, election in Britain to be fought under proportional representation to vote for the other side. Uh, so they were using the election uh, as a kind of political barometer to test their own support. In other words, to try to prove that there was a, a solid group uh, of the electorate who were against the very existence of the place, Northern Ireland. Yeah. And of course, you have people like Collins, De Valera, Arthur yes. Griffiths coming yeah. to contest the election. Um, that, that was, I mean, I mean the uh, pivotal figure in the nationalist campaign was Joe Devlin, and he uh, spoke all over uh, Northern Ireland. He was elected eventually to in West Belfast and in Antrim, in County Antrim. Uh, and he spoke at many rallies, outdoor and indoor rallies, uh, across Northern Ireland. Uh, the Sinn Féin um, uh, campaign was more uh, disrupted, as you might imagine, because of, you, you remember what was going on in the rest of Ireland. But you had people like Arthur Griffiths standing in Fermanagh in South Tyrone, you had Michael Collins standing in Armagh, and you had Eamon de Valera standing in, in County Down, and there's some fantastic uh, photographs of them being escorted by the RIC uh, 
uh, across the border uh, to take part in these in these rallies. And quite often the rallies and their appearance at the rallies were shrouded in secrecy because they didn't want any uh, the, their leaders and their candidates being uh, being um, arrested or whatever and sent back. Yeah. So it, you know, unsurprisingly, is you know a victory for the, the official uh, Unionist Party when it comes to the opening of Parliament. Can we talk about that because it's in City Hall, you know, not too far away from here. Yeah. Can we talk about? you know, the, the King coming to open Parliament, what was said, and, you know, the atmosphere of the place. I mean, it, as you say, it, was, it wasn't a surprise, the Unionist victory, although I think the scale of it was surprising. Uh, Unionists had put up 40 candidates uh, for the 52-seat legislature. Uh, all 40 candidates were elected, were re returned. Uh, the uh, uh, UIL ended up putting forward uh, 13 candidates, Sinn Féin 20. Each of them managed to have six of their candidates elected, uh, but of course they didn't take up their seats. So the 22nd of June 1921 was very much a loyalist occasion, one for celebration, uh, like a kind of extra 12th of July, I suppose, really. And it was also the first time that there had been a, a British monarch visiting the country for decades. Um, and uh, so Loyalist Belfast turned out to welcome the King and Queen. There was an enormous uh, security presence on the day. Uh, uh, the uh, Belfast uh, city centre, they, they arrived at the docks, they were met by Craig and his wife, uh, and they came in a, a, a carriage pulled by four white horses brought over from London. I'll come back to them in a moment. Um, well, and they took them into the down High Street, uh, Royal Avenue, Donegal Place, and into the City Hall. Uh, there was a grandstand, a temporary grandstand, holding 3,000, and you can see it in the newsreel f footage of the events, uh, in place for the uh, privileged members of society in those, in those seats. Uh, there were uh, loyalist bunting everywhere in the heartlands and also in the city centre. Uh, and it was very much an occasion for celebration for one section of the community. Uh, there had been all industry had closed for the day. For the Catholics, it was a very different story because many of them had been uh, forced out of their jobs the previous summer. Some of them were still not working. Uh, many of them had been forced from their homes, including some quite recently uh, in the weeks before uh, the, the, uh, this occasion. Uh, and so they, for them, it was a day of trepidation and, um, and some anxiety, to say the least. Coming on to the actual speech, I mean, the king was only in uh, the new Northern Ireland for between five and six hours before he and his wife uh, returned in the royal yacht. Uh, his advisers had been against the trip because uh, they feared uh, an IRA assassination attempt, which did not come at that time. But Again, I'll refer to that in a second. Um, he made a speech um, where he was talking about the need for peace across Ireland. And remember, at this time, uh, there was still a war against the British uh, going on in the rest of Ireland. Um, and so the King's speech was very much one which was directed at the whole of the Irish people. Uh, in one sense, it was successful because in pleading, pleading for peace and conciliation, uh, the IRA eventually did have a truce uh, a couple of weeks after this, although it did not apply in practice to the North where the actual uh, problems, uh, if anything, uh, got worse. But the King took advantage of the opportunity. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just read an extract of his speech to appeal to the assembled representatives, who were, as I said, all unionist MPs. Uh, it, it's a very uh, famous speech, of course. I speak from a full heart when I pray that my coming to Ireland today may prove to be the first step towards the end of strife among her people, whatever their race or creed. In that hope, I appeal to all Irishmen to pause, to stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, to forgive and forget, and to join in making for the land they love a new era of peace, contentment, and goodwill. And of course, um, he, um, that was the main part. He met representatives, he met 
uh, various uh, dignitaries. And then he went across the road to the Ulster Hall where he met um, a gathering of former servicemen. Remember, this was only for three years after the end of the war and he met quite a few of the Irish soldiers, the 36th Ulster uh, Regiment survivors and other Irish soldiers uh, before going back to, uh, to the Royal Yacht. Um, the sequel I must mention to this, um, the, 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 the Loyalist press were quite triumphant about it. The Nationalist press were a lot low, their mood was low key one. Uh, they, they pointed out the actual reality for Catholics at that time. Um, and the IRA's response to the King's plea for uh, peace was quite unequivocal because within 48 hours uh, of uh, the King's speech, an IRA squad attacked a military train uh, and bombed the last carriage uh, uh, or two of that train, killing six people uh, and also over 80 horses including the horses who had pulled the king's carriage, uh, we think, uh, uh, a few uh, hours, a couple of days before. Um, yeah, so it was quite an eventful day. So, Alan, after, you know, two years of intense violence, you've, you've uh, demonstrated that very well in the book and in the interview here. Can we talk about how that violence cooled off? Because we're in, still in a period where, you know, there's a lot of flux right throughout the, isle, the island. What was, you know, the catalyst for yeah, the cooling yeah, so, off well, period? That's a good, uh, uh, pertinent uh, question. I mean, the, 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 uh, before I come to that, the, the pivotal point of the violence was, of course, in um, the first half of 1922. And then a couple of things happened. Uh, well, more than a couple, but two big things happened. Uh, in the early summer of uh, 1922. Um, uh, one was the uh, uh, introduction of Special Powers Act, uh, emergency legislation, where many of the IRA activists initially were interned. Initially, uh, after a while, the UPA, some of them were interned as well. Uh, and uh, also, crucially, you had, of course, uh, the split within republicanism in the South, uh, which led to, to the even bloodier Irish Civil War, which started um, in uh, the summer of 19, in August 1922. Uh, and uh, some of the IRA were disillusioned in the North because of the Special Powers Act. A number, a small number of them moved uh, to the various pro-treaty and anti-treaty factions in the South. Uh, uh, Craig then turned his attention to um, putting the loyalist violent uh, uh, lowest uh, paramilitary leaders in prison and in, in internment. So things did fizzle out by the autumn. The last conflict fatality uh, was uh, in the short strand, I think it was, uh, in October uh, 1922. There's a really interesting part that you, of your book and it's a postscript and you call it A Brave New World. And what really strikes me about that is that there's a focus on the economy. There's a focus on wider societal issues that the new administration had to contend with. Now, in my sort of reading of this period, there's not much focus on that. It's more focus on the high politics. Can we talk about what the new administration was faced with in terms of yeah, employment again, and perhaps what the reaction was? Yeah, it's an interesting point. Uh, the, um, unfortunately uh, for the society in the North at that time, uh, when partition was taking place, in the early summer of 100 years ago, uh, it coincided uh, with a massive uh, economic depression. It wasn't quite as bad as the economic depression of the late 20s and early 30s, but it was bad. In, in the wartime, of course, uh, the Belfast economy, the greater Belfast economy had been vibrant, uh, as it was in the, during the Second War. Um, so uh, the rope works, which were the biggest in the world, were producing uh, ropes for the Royal Navy in their fight against the Germans uh, on the seas. Uh, they, uh, they, they were busy building ships. Uh, the linen factories were busy. Um, uh, but after the war, in about 1921, that period of time, uh, there, there were, um, although the shipbuilding industry was reasonably vibrant, reasonably vibrant for another few years. Uh, there was a decline in linen industry, which of course was a big 
a supplier, a big employer for uh, of female labour uh, at that point, and they they had. Um, uh, unfortunately, in America, which was their biggest market, uh, the Americans uh, had high tariffs in that period, which meant that uh, it was difficult to sell the goods and other textiles had been uh, brought in and cheaper, uh, they were being made more cheaply in other countries. So there was a, uh, there was uh, certainly, there was a large number of unemployed. I think it was, uh, I quote the exact figure in the book, I think it was 78,000 were unemployed at the time of this. And of course, unemployment, as you know, uh, uh, can fester uh, bad Ill, Ill feelings towards those uh, who are employed, particularly if they are of a different religion in a, a kind of society prone to sectarianism on both sides, like, a, like, a, like this one. There's a thing that you've, you've, you've mentioned to me about this sort of human interest element of it. And you, you did a lot of oral history yeah, um, yeah. interviews when you first started researching this a number of decades ago. That's right, yeah. What, what was the impression from those people of, of this period in time? I interviewed probably about 20 of them or 15, 20 people from different parts of the community, uh, mainly in Belfast. Um, uh, one of them was the legendary Irish news journalist, um, uh, Jimmy Kelly. Uh, and. <coughs> Jimmy Kelly uh, was was an amazing man, and he he uh, he and, and some of the other people did tell of his of their visits into Belfast on the tram cars because the tram car was the main mode of transport for working class people in those days. And he describes, and I just quote, um, or maybe to, if you have time for a couple of quotes, I do one from Jimmy. Um, the old red, this was a, a trip into the city centre from his home on the Falls Road on a Saturday afternoon. The old red and yellow coloured tram car swayed, whined and groaned over the rails down the Falls Road. There were certain danger points when it passed Cooper Street, Conway Street, the Thumbland Street and uh, Dover Street, long streets leading from the Falls to the Shankle. Across these streets at um, moments of tension, the report of rifle fire rang out as snipers on both sides opened up. The tram speeded and clanked past these streets as the driver crouched down on the deck behind the controls and the passengers took their cue and they huddled down on the floor which the tramways department had thoughtfully provided with a carpet of straw. There were always sighs of relief when the neutral Castle Junction hove into sight. Another chap I interviewed was Sam Jemison. These people were all in their 80s and uh, 90s when I interviewed them, but their memories of these occasions were, were quite uh, profound and deep and strong. Sam Jemison uh, had lived in, in central Belfast. His father had been a leading fire officer uh, and uh, he was attached uh, to the, um, the, the fire station, the, the Whitless Street fire station uh, near the BBC there. In Omo, just on the edge of Omo Avenue. And he wrote, uh, I think this is quite um, an interesting account, uh, he told me. My father and his colleagues were very busy during the troubles and were called out to deal with many fires caused by incendiaries. They were even shot at on occasions. And it wasn't easy for us either, mind you. You see, the families of fire officers lived in the station and we had to play in the wee yard out at the back. The station also housed ambulances and it was an exciting place for us to be at the time, what with fire engines rushing to put out fires and the ambulances bringing in the bodies of those shot or blown up in the disturbances. They used the station as a temporary morgue and our mothers frequently had to chase us youngsters away when they were laying out the bodies. So those memories and lots more uh, actually stayed with uh, those youngsters uh, throughout their long lives. So, Alan Parkinson, thanks very much for coming in and joining me today. A pleasure, Barry. <laughs> <laughs>